first off, just uh, thank you for being here this evening, late on a Monday night. Uh, thank you for coming. And uh, I also want to mention that this program, it's being grant funded from the National Network of the Library of Medicine. And we're also partnering with all of us UCSD. At this time, I'd like to welcome to the stage Eric Mitchell, the UCSD University Librarian, to introduce our featured speaker. Hey, how are we doing? Yeah, good. Um, as Oscar said, uh, I'm Eric Mitchell. I'm the University Librarian at UC San Diego and incredibly honored to be able to introduce our author tonight. Um, this is the inaugural author lecture as part of the Circuit Library's focus on sustainability and climate resilience. I can't wait to hear from our speaker tonight, Winona LaDuc, a Harvard-educated economist, environmental activist. There you go. <laughs> There's even more, author, uh, farmer, grandmother, uh, and a two-time former Green Party vice president candidate with Ralph Nader. Uh, Winona specializes in rural development, economic, food, and energy sovereignty, and environmental justice. Uh, living and working on the White Earth Reservation in northern Minnesota, she founded several organizations, including Honor the Earth, uh, which was co-founded with the Indigo Girls 28 years ago, years ago, and the Anishabi Agricultural Institute. Through these organizations, Leduc develops and models cultural-based sustainable development practices focused on renewable energy and sustainable food systems. She's an international thought leader and lecturer in climate justice, renewable energy, and environmental justice, as well as an advocate for protecting indigenous plants and heritage foods from patenting and genetic engineering, excuse me, engineering. Yeah. So LaDuc has been recognized as a national leader for many, many years. Uh, she was cited by Time Magazine in 1994, uh, MS Magazine in 1998, and Forbes in 2021 as a leader. That's just amazing over so many years. She has written extensively on Native American and environmental issues and is a former board member of Greenpeace USA and serves as the co-chair of the Indigenous Women's Network, a, Northern, a North American Pacific Indigenous Women's Association. So her seven books uh, include The Militarization of Indian County, Recovering the Sacred, uh, The Power of Naming and Claiming, a nonfiction book, All Our Relations, Native Struggles for Land and Life, and a novel, Last Standing Woman. Her new book, uh, To Be a Water Protector, Rise of the Wendigo Slayers is an expansive, provocative engagement with issues that have been central to her many years of activism, including seven years battling a tar sands oil pipeline in northern Minnesota. So with all of that, Winona, please come to the stage. Thank you for being here. Hello there. Thank you so much for having me. I want to say a special miigwech to all the indigenous people who came out tonight to hang out and uh, happy Native American month. But is it every day, Native American? I feel like every day, every day, every day. But uh, and really grateful to the libraries for bringing me here. I'm going to tell you a little story about the little library we bought in northern Minnesota. As kind of at the end of this, I'm happy with the, I'm happy with that. But I just want to, again, uh, uh, thank you for this opportunity. Wait, here's somebody cool going to make this slideshow go up. Boom! That's how they do it. Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> so um, um, I'm a water protector. This is a water protector uh, pa uh, painting. You know, I'm um, an Anishinaabe from the White Earth Reservation. Galbabani Kog Ishkanaganing. I'm a bear clan, and um, but I'm also and I'm also water protector. So this is uh, in downtown Duluth, and this is a native woman who's not going missing anytime soon. She's about uh, 30 feet wide and 40 feet tall, Second Street and Second Avenue, and uh, she's a water protector. And um, so I'm going to talk, you know, about how we all need to be these water protectors in these times that we are, but uh, this is art by Votan. He's from out by this way, but it's downtown Duluth. 
This is some art from my territory, which is called, we're all in the same canoe, <laughs> which is actually true. You know, uh, we are all, uh, no matter where we are, we are facing the same challenges and we all drink the same water. And um, I like this art because um, this is Anishinaabe art. I don't, I don't know if you've seen this style of art, but when I was an undergraduate at Harvard, if you wanted to see the art of Europe, you went to the fine arts program. But if you wanted to see indigenous art, you went to anthropology. And so I just say that because that's kind of the valuation or lack of valuation of indigenous knowledge and indigenous art in these, you know, Western institutions, and, and I think that perhaps it's important to consider that the solutions to the problems that have been created by this society may not be found in this society. The same paradigm which created the solutions, the, the problem is not likely to create the solutions. And that's why we all must work together to have our, to come for our solutions, you know. And this is uh, kind of like called X-ray this, this piece, you could see some of the beings are inside, and then sometimes you can see that the beings are all related to each other. You know, it's called x-ray vision, how they look inside the beings. But, you know, it's just important to understand the, uh, you know, the intricacy of some of the indigenous thinking, which is, you know, everybody was indigenous someplace once, and we had this kind of thinking. You know, those of us who are here, we've been, uh, you know, a little, a lot closer, you know, than a lot of folks. but. This is where I live on the White Earth Reservation, Gawawiegaba Ground Lake. Um, it is in the uh, southeast corner of the reservation, and I and I live there, and I farm nearby. Uh, on, and I'll talk about our farming later. But I, you know, I like to start by talking about, um, you know, America has a lot of of um, amnesia. We'll go with that. You know, we have historic amnesia, and we have um, what I think of as, as ecological amnesia. That is that you don't remember what was here. And so you begin to take for granted that there's no trees there anymore because there's never trees there, but there was trees there before, or there was a river there, or there was, you know, whatever it is. And so, you know, I think about uh, that we need to remember, and I don't want to be someone who forgets what was, and I don't think we want to forget it. You know, and, and um, so I, I, uh, I think of um, making America great again, and this is my idea of when America was great. <laughs> You know, when there were 50 million buffalo, that's when America was great. Single largest migratory herd in the world, you know, made prairies. Uh, single largest migratory herd in the world, lived on 250 different species of grass in the northern plains. Uh, tremendous biodiversity, and, and a buffalo in the wintertime does not need to be fed at a trough, does not need water, does not need grain. Buffalo just needs uh, that land there. And so that's when America was great, is when there were 50 million buffalo. America was great when t there were 10,000 varieties of corn. Those corn varieties did not come from guys at Syngenta or Monsanto. Those corn varieties came from people who looked like me or like half the people in this room. You know, because corn is, you know, corn is one of those things that I think is super important to remember because corn doesn't exist in nature. And a lot of times, like I, probably like a lot of you, I'm kind of weary of humans. I'm like, we really botched things up. You know, I was like, I'm not always a big fan of the humans, right? But the thing is, is that corn is an example of when humans and the creator and the, and the plants work together. Because in nature, corn is teosinte, which is a grass. And it's not, it's not corn at all. But all those varieties were developed, you know, and, and changed, like all the different colors, everything was, was made, you know, and uh, that's what humans can do. We can do beautiful things. You know, we can remember that. So never forget that we can do beautiful things. And, and that's what we need to do is to be the beautiful, the people who do the beautiful things. And America was great when there was nine, 900 varieties of potatoes. Now, this is a picture from the uh, Peruvian Potato Museum. And there is still tremendous agrobiodiversity in potatoes. And I, you know, and, and it's interesting because in these times of climate chaos that are coming, the, you know, scientists are studying these potatoes because they're wondering like how we're gonna all survive. And the fact is, is that the agrobiodiversity is really the answer. I think the Irish potato famine should have taught us that. You don't, want, you don't want one crop. You want as much diversity as you can have because that's, how, that's what resilience is in, that diversity. But in that, you know, the other, the other thing is, is like, I mean, I, we grow, last year we grew 17 varieties of potatoes. And, um, you know, I mean, if you could grow purple potatoes, wouldn't you just grow purple potatoes? <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? It's like, why would you just grow Yukon Golds if you could grow all these other really great varieties, you know? 
And uh, so I want to encourage you to grow a lot of potatoes, I guess, is that there are different, <laughs> different varieties, but to look at that. But that's, in my mind, you know, some of the things that we cannot, we, we not only don't want to forget, we want to honor and we want to bring them back. You know, to whatever extent we can bring all these guys back, the better shot we got. And then this is my territory as well. This is wild rice or Minoman. And uh, our Minoman, people will look at that picture and they'll think that that's a pasture, but that's actually a field of wild rice. That's Lower Rice Lake. That's my friend Don Goodwin and I out there on the dock going into Lower Rice Lake. And Don Goodwin and I were just acquitted about a month ago of our final water protector charges. Yeah. And, um, it's kind of epic. The court ruled that to further criminalize those women would be a crime unto itself. In the interests of justice, they dismissed all charges against three of us, three Anishinaabe women. But, you know, like I said, I'm a water protector. I'm not a criminal. And this is what we're protecting here is our wild rice, our Minoman. And, and the thing about wild rice or Minoman is that, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know if I fully appreciated this, but like a lot of people spend a lot of their, a good portion of their life in a rice paddy. A lot of the world raises rice, you know, and that is a staple of their food. And one day this Thai rice farmer came to visit us because they were fighting the genetic modification of their rice and we were fighting genetic modification of wild rice, right? We did win that battle, I mean, but, you know, but they, they, he came up and he said, where's your rice, where's your rice? And I pointed out to the lake and he was like, I was like, yeah, that's our rice. And that's the point that I realized that all we had to do was to take care of our lake. And if we took care of our lake, the rice would come. You know, each year in succession, the rice will come. And sometimes it comes in, in early and sometimes late and it looks different. You know, it looks like a bottle brush, some of it, and some looks all punked out. And, and then, uh, you know, and in the time of climate change, like it's been very tough, there's been droughts the last few years, you know, up north in ways that we never had before, but, you know, some of the rice just came in then. And I think about that because, um, you know, I want you to remember that because there's a lake up by us, there's one called Ogichi Lake and another lake called Omimi Lake. And both those lakes, they were, the rice was drowned out. It was drowned out by non-Indians who had big boats on the lake and convinced the state to raise the water levels in the lake. That's what they did, they convinced them to raise the water levels. And, and the tribe, this is a Mille Lacs band, for many years tried to get them to lower the water levels and they wouldn't, they wouldn't lower them. And then the drought came, and you know what came back? The rice. And in one lake it was 17 years it had not been there. And in another lake it was 50 years. So that teaches you something about the power of seeds. You know, the power of resilience and, and uh, you know, so I bet on the seeds, you know, I bet on the seeds, but this is our Minoma and our wild rice. So, you know, back when America was great, there was a lot more wild rice too. And the remaining wild rice is really in our territories up in northern Minnesota, and that's what we've been fighting to protect, you know. But, you know, the, the conflict that is going on today is not a new conflict. I, I, you know, this is kind of my idea of like what it looks like, you know, there's, there's Sitting Bull and Custer, right? You know, but it's true. You know, it's two different worldviews. One's about conquest and one's about survival. And that's what we really have to, you know, look at and consider because, you know, the fact is, is that, is that you might, we might want to be working on survival now. You know, I think empire is vastly overrated. You know, it is not, not nor is it durable, you know, and uh, what we want to do is to survive. But, you know, these two really exemplify the arrogance of one man and the, and the resilience and persistence and spiritual knowledge of the other, you know. So, uh, this you probably don't know, but this, I mean, you probably don't need this one, but, you know, this is a little bit about uh, what, what land theft looks like, the building of America, and the, and the destruction and the theft of our territories, you know. And, uh, so um, and this is the, the way of, of this worldview. Now, our, um, our ancestors talked long ago, and uh, they have, you know, in our prophecies, and a lot of our people had prophecies, and I, and I think about those a lot today, really informs the work that we do in my community. And they're not like far away things, they're very real, you know, but they talked a long time ago about um, that 
they would be, uh, you know, the first fire. They talked they talk about it in terms of fires. So they said, you know, um, and let me just back up and say that Anishinaabe people, uh, we're really people like other people. I don't know their teachings, but we're driven by, uh, we're guided by these prophecies. And so, for instance, uh, we are uh, Algonquin speakers. And uh, I think the Weots are Algonquin speakers. There's one people out here in uh, California, I think, Northern California. But uh, really, an, an East Coast, you know, the Wampanoags, the Pasamaquoddies, the Penobscots, the Mi'kmaq, they're all Algonquin speakers. And in our, uh, the Lenape, so we are those people. And then uh, we are instructed to follow a, a shell in the sky to the place where the food grows upon the water. That was our instructions as people. And that happened over a period of, they say about 500 years. You know, I mean, back in the day, you were canoeing, right? So you were getting there. And so where they came to, where the food grows on the water is where the wild rice is. But they said, you must go there because your, your people will survive. And it is true that our people, the Anishinaabe people, we have, you know, we have a lot of our people left and a lot of our water and our rice left. And the people that were our relatives to the east had a much tougher time, a much tougher time, you know. Um, but in our prophecies, we were talk they talked about these fires and they talked about that, you know, in the fires like around the fourth fire, that people, the third fire, people would come and some would be good and some would be not good. That's true. You know, some people that came were just, you know, decent people and some people were complete jerks. Let's just not pretend that those founding fathers were nice guys, you know. And then they talked about how a lot of our things would disappear. You know, first they said our people would disappear and we didn't have a word for smallpox. But that must have been what they're talking about. You know, our people would just like perish. 95% of our people is wiped out, you know. Then they talked about that our things would disappear and nobody really had a word for anthropologist. But that's what they're talking about, like when they would haul off all your stuff to the museum, right? And all of us are facing that. You know, every indigenous community is still trying to get back our, like our medicine bundles or our drums. My tribe lost 13 drums and I think we got seven of them back. You know, that's how you heal, you know? And then they talked about how our people would go to sleep and they say that that was like the residential school or the boarding schools, you know, because they were just really suppressed us to make us forget, you know, who we are, try to make us dormant, you know, forget who our spirits were. And they talked about how our, our new people would be born. They call that the sixth fire. In the sixth fire, they said some people would be born and those people would go back and find things that were that have been stolen or left along the way. And so that was really the time that we were born into, you know, where you saw the beginning of the, you know, recovery of language, the decriminalization of our ceremonies, the return of our feasts, you know, the return of many of our traditions and the work to keep our languages. You know, that is in that time they talked about. They said these new people then that in the time of the seventh fire, we'd have a choice between paths. They said that there would be two paths, and one path they said would be well-worn, but it would be scorched. And the other path they said would not be well-worn, and it would be green. And it would be our choice upon which path to embark. And uh, that's, this is the scorched path. That's what these pictures are. And this is what it looks like, you know, is the extractive ownership, the taking more than you need and not leaving the rest. You know, I refer to this as Windigo economics. That is the economics of a cannibal. And that's what it is when you destroy your mother, you know, because you think that you are so smart with your numbers that you can do this, you know. But extractive ownership is really, you know, uh, deadly. It is deadly, you know, for what it has done. And, and some of the implications, you know, we see and, and feel now, you know, uh, catastrophes of biblical proportions. That it's just, you know, acknowledge that that is the time that we're in in catastrophes of biblical proportions at, at all levels. And, you know, that the, uh, you know, it's, it, you know, it's not only the, the human and environmental costs, it's actually a very significant cost. And the fact is, is that no city, county, tribe, 
has a budget for climate change. We have no plan, we have no idea what's happening, and they are building like they don't even think it's happening, you know? And, uh, but you know, the fact is, is that it is all, you know, these are the times that we live in. And uh, I think about that because I think about that, uh, you know, and this is how we got here, right? This is what it looks like. But, you know, in these times, there are people that wake up and they become, as Trudell would say, coherent. They remain coherent. And that's what we got to do is we got to remain coherent in these times that are upon us, you know? And I think about it and I think about uh, that we are born in the times of prophecy. And being born in this time of prophecies, what is it that we are to do? And really our instructions are there. You know, as I, as I think about it, you know, um, I mean, I was, I'm, 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 you know, I'm 64 years old. I've had a lot of privilege in my life. I get to hung out, hang out with a lot of cool, listen to a cool, a lot of cool elders speak. Some of this guy here probably know like Thomas Benyaka. Remember that guy, you know, uh, uh, Matthew King, uh, Frank Fool's Crow. Uh, Oren Lyons, he's around still, uh, Philip Deere. You know, I heard those guys as a young woman speak, and I remember Thomas said one time, they talked about these times, but one of the things they talked about, and indigenous teachings are, you know, the concept of, the construct of Armageddon is not an indigenous construct. That's a really, uh, it comes from a different worldview that is not ours. In our understanding of the world, there is life, you know, birth, there is, there is birth, there is life, there is, you know, living through this life, and then there is death, and there is rebirth. That is why you have spring, you know, and so we have an understanding of a cyclical worldview, which is a lot different than a linear worldview. And the linear worldview is really what gives you, gets you uh, walking dead, you know, the Armageddon construct. And so, you know, I say that, but I know that, um, what those prophets always said, or Thomas Benyaka would talk about as the birth of a new world. That's what they would say. They would say a new world is coming and these are the signs that that world is coming. They would say things like that. And you know, being a young woman, you'd hear those things. They talk about the gourd of ashes falling from the sky. That'd be something that would signify that. They said that that was the atomic bomb. That's what they said, you know. And then I remember Thomas Benyaka used to talk about and this is in the 70s and the early 80s, they talked about how there'd be a spider web in the sky. I don't know, do you remember that? They said that spider web in the sky. And we were all trying to figure out what that was. Now, what do you think that was? I feel like that was the World Wide Web that they were talking about. But in the 70s, like, why would an older, hopey man think about the web in the sky? You understand what I'm saying? So in those times, I talked about the transformation, and it is certainly true. You know, these times are times of great transformation. And so I say, you know, get your hats, <laughs> get your prayers, you know, because the times are changing. And the question is, is, is we don't control the change, but we, could, could, we, we have more to say. We have more agency. And if you're going to let other guys control the change, you're not going to like what it looks like. That's just my, my experience <laughs> over the years, you know. So... This is a little bit about the resistance. This is a picture from, I think, 2014. Uh, this is a Mi'kmaq woman up in what's no, called New Brunswick in northern Canada fighting fracking. And they leased out all that land to fracking. And I, I just picture is kind of like the, the, you know, the, the, the resistance that has been in our indigenous communities. You know? And um, then a lot of you are familiar with the battles. I'm going to talk briefly about these battles of people who are saying that's enough. You know, this is the battle at Standing Rock, and you know, just for a map, uh, you know, I just think it's important to point out what, what environmental justice looks like and what racism looks like, because the first, the northern uh, line was the original uh, pipeline route that was proposed. But then the city of Bismarck, being mostly white, 83% white, said, we don't want a pipeline north of our water supply. And so they instead, they put the pipeline across the Standing Rock, the northern, you know, just next to the Standing Rock Reservation, right? And so, you know, it's really important to say, you know, because indigenous people, although we are people of color, we're landed people. And so we're the people that have the uranium and the coal and the pipeline projects because we're the people that, 
you know, uh, have land. And so what racism looks like is that. That's what that looks like. And, and you know, we just, I've, I've experienced it and been fighting it for these, you know, because it's wrong. And, and, you know, the problem with these times, not the problem, of, of when it, the largest problems of these times is, you know, we could call it affluenza, but we could also just call it, we could just point to uh, kind of like late stage fossil fuels addiction. Because we're all addicts. You know, I'm right with you. I've lived my whole life in the fossil fuel era, my whole life. You know, I went to drive-in movies. How many of you went to drive-in movies? Right, that was really fun, huh? You know, but you, you understand what I'm saying is, it's like, you know, I didn't do it today, but sometimes I, you know, yeah, I mean, I flew, you know, and then, but then sometimes you get that, you know, your flowers from Colombia the next day, or your, or maybe you want to get your, your Fiji water. I particularly think that's great. 8,000 miles away, I'm going to drink some water from 8,000 miles away. You understand what I'm saying? Like, that's this whole system that's set up with so much fossil fuels that are not essential. This is not essential, this level of, of consumption and addiction. But the problem is when you're an addict and you have a society that is jacked up on fossil fuels, basically, you know, about a fifth, a fifth of our, of our energy, of our, you know, of our economy has to do with, with energy. And the problem is, is that when you have that level of addiction, you can make some bad decisions because addicts make bad decisions. I have a couple addicts in my family and I can just predict that their decisions will be bad, you know? And, and that's, that is where we're at. And, and, and to add to that, the problem is, is that, you know, as you look out there in public policy and who makes decisions, it's like you let your dealers make your public policy. That's a bad idea. Don't let dealers make public policy, you know? But that's what has happened, and I don't think there's a person in here that doesn't see that going on. You know, how you get, like, you know, different parts per million, different, you know, water allocations, different justifications for how much pollution will be there. You know, change your recommended daily allowance of whatever it is. You know, that, is, that has nothing to do with common sense. That has to do with politics, which has to do with oil, or has to do with corporations, you know? So when, when you become addicted, you make a lot of bad decisions and you violate a lot of people's human rights. These are, you know, I could show a lot of pictures from Standing Rock, or you could come see our museum in northern Minnesota, full of pictures of Standing Rock. But this is, you know, uh, when corporations, the rights of corporations supersede the rights of individuals, which is what you're looking at here. $38 million worth of military equipment and force taken upon people who are water protectors. $38 million is how much North Dakota spent on it, and you know, this is um, Mega May Pen Plenicu, and she is, is, is in, I mean, I, I, this is like an epic photo, right? But the thing is, is like in this photo, you can see, I mean, that's an MRAP, that thing over there, a mine-resistant armored personnel carrier, that thing on the right. And it says Stutzman County on it. Now, if somebody wants to explain to me why Stutzman County, with 5,000 people in it, needs an MRAP. You understand what I'm saying? They don't even have, that's, in, that's intended to drive through a building. They don't even have a building that they need to drive it through. <laughs> and Stutzman County, you, you understand what I'm saying? But this is what happens when you surplus military equipment to civilian police forces. And then they got something they shouldn't have, right? That should not be used on people. That shouldn't be used on people anywhere, you know? But the second thing is an LRAD, that black thing, and that's intended to bust your earlobes, your ear, eardrums, you know? That was all deployed upon us at Standing Rock. And so that, you know, that's what I'm saying is late stage fossil fuel addiction, you can do some nasty stuff if you're an addict. You know, but we, you know, we continue to, to stand and oppose them. And it was interesting because last week, last week is when they finally had the hearing on the environmental impact statement on the Dakota Access Pipeline. They didn't even have an environmental impact statement and the hearing was in Bismarck last week. I asked one of my sisters uh, how it went and she said, well, first they had us like, they try to control the whole thing and like you could like, yeah, you had to sign up and then they call you and then you go into a room, you know, which is how you don't really have public testimony. <laughs> it becomes, you know, it's so controlled, right? 
And so then at a certain point, about, I don't know, 15 minutes in, these Indian women got the bullhorn. <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> so pretty soon everybody just gave their, their testimony with the bullhorn, and then pretty much they just gave up and gave them the mic. I was like, there you go, you know? Social movements are disorderly. Let's continue. <laughs> anyway, so uh, this is the battle at Standing Rock, but I have spent the last 10 years fighting these pipelines. And people will say, you know, how'd you do? I'll say, well, we beat a few of them. You know, in uh, 2016, there was five proposed tar sands pipeline. There was the uh, Energy East, which was a uh, Trans-Canada pipeline going across Canada and ending up in Montreal, through Mon going through Montreal. There was the uh, Northern Gateway, an Enbridge pipeline going to the Pacific Coast. There was the Keystone XL pipeline, right? KXL pipeline. There was the Line 3 pipeline. And then there was the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Now, the first three pipelines didn't happen. These, those three pipelines did not happen. And they didn't happen because of people like us. They said, that's a really bad idea, and you're not going to do it, and we're going to keep fighting you. And it became too expensive, and, and they, they, didn't, they didn't make those three pipelines. Trans Mountain looks like they might get in, and they got in this pipeline here, which is line three. And so um, the thing is, is that Enbridge is the largest purveyor of tar sands oil in the country. And uh, they bring it all in from Canada, and they have these giant main lines, which, as you see, they go through the Great Lakes. And this is what our battle is over, because we believe that water is more valuable than oil. And uh, so I spent a lot of time fighting line three, but uh, this is what it looks like after you run out of every hearing. I went to every hearing. I didn't miss a beat with a whole bunch of other people. We testified, we submitted everything, and they still approved the line. Because late stage addictions, you know, you make bad decisions. And so this is us. This is actually what all my charges just got dismissed on this case here. Um, but, uh, you know, when you run out of, when you run out of uh, ways to make the system work, you just stand there and, and bear witness and, and, and try to stop them. And so 1,000 people were arrested in northern Minnesota. I'm going back on uh, Wednesday and Thursday, there's trials uh, for two 67-year-old women, you know, who were, who were charged to, it, it, actually, at this incident. So this is line three. And then this is my favorite of my arrest photos. You know, uh, this is on the Shell River, which is just near my house. The Shell River was crossed five times by Enbridge. And these are my grandkids here. Um, and uh, this was, you know, a bunch of elderly women like myself in, uh, we had some lawn chairs. That seemed like the way to go. <laughs> Someone asked me if I wanted to have like a bike lock around my neck. I said, no, not really. <laughs> I'll just take the long chair with the logging chain around my neck, you know. But I'm, if you get a chance, you should look at our video. We have a couple of videos on this, but there's one called, uh, we, I, I'm a big Jackson Brown fan, and so it's to Jackson Brown's song, I Am a Patriot. And we put this video of our arrest on there, you know, because uh, I'm a patriot to the land, not to the flag, to the land. And um, so we, we stayed there, and, and uh, they looked at us, and they looked really mean at us. And then for four hours, for four hours, we sat there. And I'm just going to tell you, in case you ever want to do this, depends. Wear some depends, right? Because I was like, I'll stay here a long time. I got my depends on, you know. <laughs> just to say, if you're ever wondering how that works out, just get some depends. Uh, but um, it was the worst drought in the history of the state. And then uh, four hours in, it poured. It was the first time it had rained in three months. It poured on us. And that's when they arrested us as cops. We're like, we're out of here. We're going to get wet. But I'm, I'm going to tell you, wearing a depends in a rainstorm is not what you want to do. <laughs> I'm just saying, by the time I got to jail, I was like hiking my diaper. You understand what I'm saying? And have you ever seen a baby's diaper that got in the pool with all those little, like, gel things in there? That's what it looked like. I was like, it's like, sorry, cops, I'm just dropping some diaper parts here. <laughs> anyway, live and learn, right? <laughs> anyway, so um, now that I've given you the depressing part, let me talk about this, the solutions part. I call this the sitting bull plan. And that's largely because he was a brilliant man. And one of the things he said is, let us put our minds together to see what kind of future we can make for our children. Let us put our minds together to see what kind of future we can make for our children. And I think that that's really it. 
You know, see, people are waiting for somebody to fix this for them. Nobody's going to fix this. This is us. You know, I, I think that we have recently figured out that Elon Musk is not fixing this for us, right? <laughs> I mean, but you know what I'm saying is that's kind of like the thing. It's like, oh, Elon will do it. No, nobody. It's us. It's changing our behavior, changing our systems, you know, transforming. And so I'm going to talk about how we do that. So this is first, this is like my super complicated chart. But the point of this chart is, ah, people say you can't meet present energy demand with renewable energy. That's what they always say. They say you're never going to do it. To which I respond with the Lawrence Livermore lab that says you waste 67, 66.7% of your energy is wasted in the present system of inefficiency. Now, what does that mean? Point of origin and point of consumption, whether it is, you know, whatever it is that is over here, by the time it gets through all those pipes and goes through whatever inefficient systems, by the time it's done, you've wasted two thirds of the energy. And so point one would be, you do not want to try to meet present energy demand. You want to diminish present energy demand. You want to relocalize energy use and you want to make it more accountable. Right, you know, all, all across the board. And so there's not one solution. The main solution is quit using so much. That'd be the main thing, right? And so I just, like, I always think it's important to point this out and each, you know, everywhere along the way, you know, there's some level of inefficiency. So I'm gonna start with like how you fix things. And this is, of course, very cute Buffalo. But, but, the, but the point is, is that, is it you, you know, we need to think, we, we must think deep about what a transition looks like. You know, so to me, one of the essential strategies is obviously is, you know, I mean, you look at the Central Valley, like the fact is, is that the agricultural system, the meat in this country is toxic. You know, I don't think that, I think that pretty much most people will get that. And my point would be that, so in the place where there were once 50 million buffalo, there are now 28 million cattle. And those cattle require an entire fossil fuel system to support them. That is to say, they cannot go out there and just like a buffalo in the winter goes like this, like kind of like a giant corkscrew and gets down, gets the grass and then gets up and then goes cruising around, right? Uh, a cow cannot do that. And in a blizzard, who survives? A buffalo. In the freak blizzards that they've had in the Northern Plains, they had 130,000 buffalo, uh, I think it was 110 to 130,000 cows died in the 2014 blizzard in North Dakota. It was a freak storm because they fled and then they just like froze in place. I was out there. We went and rode our horses along the, around the KXL proposed route and the cows were just like, like tipped over. They had frozen trying to flee the storm. They were all lined up against, it was the most morbid thing I ever saw in my life. You know, they were lined up against the fence and just froze to death and tipped over. It was, it was obscene. So what would be my point? My point would be, let's think about what, what we're gonna eat. You know, who's going to live in the freak storms? You know, you got to you got to consume less meat. But what you need is the buffalo. These are the kind of people that are the restoring the buffalo and the new treaties that are being signed, the Buffalo Treaty. I think there are 40 some indigenous nations that have signed the Buffalo Treaty with the intention of bringing back the buffalo and then also creating these corridors between the tribes and the state and public lands, trust for public lands, nature conservancy, some of these big conservation organizations are in there working with tribes to restore buffalo. You know, and to me that's like the, uh, you know, and it's not just about restoring buffalo as meat, it's about restoring buffalo because they're the animal that is from that ecosystem. And so I was up at Wind River Reservation about a month ago and Jason Valdez up there, he says to me, he says, you know, there was no buffalo hair on this land for a hundred years. You know, and I just thought about that profoundly because there was animals that relied on the buffalo hair, like the little birds, you know what I'm saying, for their nests. And so the, you know, the decimation of the buffalo meant an ch entire change in an ecosystem, the animals that were there, the, you know, nutrients that, and there's just the thundering and what their hooves do. You know, so I just think about like that, 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 that is the kind of the transformation that is needed. Plus, I just think that's the coolest teepee ever that they signed the Buffalo Treaty on. One day I'm going to get to be, and that's like a big teepee, huh? Yeah, I was like, that's like some cool architecture. This was like the 2015 or 2016 signing, I think, up of Alberta. So, you know, that is a part of it. You know, a, a second part is like just looking at our food chain. Now I'm talking to y'all in California, and you could probably eat anything, right? I mean, it's all, all growing out here, but that's dumb as could be. 
You know, we shouldn't grow everything out here and the average you know, meal travels 1,400 miles from farmer to table, which is entirely unsustainable. It adds a huge fossil fuel impact to it. And you know, in, in that entire process, it, the stability of it is, will go with questionable. Now, why would that be? Because this is what we just saw. This is what it looked like during the pandemic. This is a bunch of, I think these are carrots, obviously, being dumped. But, you know, my father he used to tell me many things. He's, but he said, one day, Winona, there'll be no food in the store. And I thought, but I just saw that, didn't I? Didn't y'all just see that with the pandemic? Because the globalized food chain is predicated on a lot of variables that are not guaranteed whether it is the fossil fuels or whether it is the labor force, you know, they, kill, they, they dumped and killed all kind of animals because they couldn't distribute them. I like what Arundhati Roy, the Indian writer says. She talks about pandemic as portal. She said, in the history of the world, pandemics always cause societies to change. This one is no different. She said, it's a portal between one world and the next. She asks the question, what are we going to bring through the portal? What are you going to take through the portal? Are you going to take your avarice, your hatred, your data banks, your dirty rivers? That's what she says. Or are you going to walk through clean? And I just, you know, each spring, there was always a new opportunity. There's always a new opportunity to walk through the portal, bring less stuff through. You know, make the transformation. But that is, you know, that is essentially what we need because, you know, if, you didn't, if we didn't get a lesson from the last pandemic, the next pandemic is going to be worse. You know, and that is the reality of these times. You know, so no matter how many scientists and smart guys we got, you know, that is, we, we are not as smart as Mother Nature. We're not, you know. So this is what happened to me in the pandemic. I ended up living on this farm with all these kids. This is my hemp farm. I'm going to talk a little bit about it later. But that was transformational for me because those kids couldn't go to school anymore. And so they all decided to move in with Granny, who had the horses. And, and other, you know, I mean, those are not all my grandchildren. Those are other people's grandchildren, too. But they're like, we're going to move in with Granny Winona because she has the horses. And so I have been living basically with like three to seven, now 16-year-old boys since the pandemic, right? <laughs> 17, they just turned 17. That one right behind me, that's my oldest grandson. That's Guy Wade in Bucanaga. He's 17. This guy up here, Josh Roy, he moved in. Then he asked me to adopt him last year. I was like, you want me to adopt you? He's like, yep. So, you know, that's how you get more grandkids, right? You know? And uh, then this is my little granddaughter, Lillian, next to me. And then these two, uh, guys, these guys are Red Lakers. And they are like, these guys are all horsemen now. They all went for horses. They all went for horses, man. They train horses. They ride horses. They ride the Dakota 38 rides. They ride all that stuff. They don't, they don't, you know. And so, you know, you sit here in this day and age, and you're like, what kind of education should we be giving these kids? You understand what I'm saying? So a lot of our work during the pandemic began, and, you know, we're teaching horse farming. That's what we're teaching. We're teaching how you grow things, you know. It's a different, it's a different kind of education. But, you know, I'll talk a little bit more about it. But, you know, this is... Uh, one of our squash, somebody else sent me this picture of the squash. It's funny, people send me these pictures. It's like getting pictures of your grandchildren, you know? <laughs> so this squash is called Gete Okosaman. And uh, about 10 years ago, someone gave me one of these squash. You know, they gave me the seeds for it. And they told me this story. They said that the squash seeds had come from an archaeological dig in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And that in that dig, uh, they had dug down, and they found a clay ball about this big, and they shook the ball, and, the, and there was something in it. So they cracked it open, and it was these seeds. And they carbonated them like 800 years old. That's what they said, right? And so, uh, you know, I, I uh, started to grow that squash out. And then, of course, I was corrected by a white guy, which is what they always do for you. Uh, he said, uh, no, that's not the correct story of the squash. He said that they're actually uh, from a Miami collection, or a Miamia is how they would say their name. Miamia collection, and uh, uh, they're a thousand years old. I was like, okay, good, glad, glad we got that squared away. You know, <laughs> and the point is, they're old, right? That is the point, you know. I, and uh, but I just had to laugh because he was like very precise. So I was like, gotcha, bro. Um, <laughs> but uh, so they, the people would ask me when I was when I was growing that squash, or I was talking about. They're like, what's that squash name? What's that squash name? I said, I don't know. And I was thinking to myself, and then I said to myself, I said you know what, white guys name stuff all the time. 
I said, I'm gonna name that squash, right? So I named this squash Gete Okosaman, which means really cool old squash. <laughs> but if you look at Baker's seed catalog, it's in there now as Gete Okosaman. I was like, we have arrived, that's it, man, right? Yeah. But it's great, it's a really a meaty squash, and the thing about it is, is I'm a big fan of squash because where I live, like, I mean, the thing is, is like, you can't garden all year round where I live. You can garden all year round. But where I live, you need things that you can keep over the winter, and those squash will stay till May. I will, I will harvest it now, and they will stay till May because it's got this outside, it's like its own storage unit. That's what's really good about a winter squash, right? And so I just want you to think about that because it's also what you eat. You know, I remember one time my, one of my nieces came in and she was like all proud vegetarian. She's like, I have these chia seeds on this coconut with the this and that and the goji berries. And I was like, I was just like, I wonder what the carbon footprint of that is. You understand what I'm saying? Like he could be all cool with all kind of cool organic stuff imported from around the world, but maybe just want to eat squash, right? I'm just saying, like think about these things, you know, because we get all special and we should just get simple, you know? All right, and then this is just the last little bit on this, which is also, I'm an economist, and so I was like, well, you know, there's the qualitative issues, but then there's the quantitative issues of your local food economy. And so you, say you spent, you know, you know, 86% of your money on buying food someplace else. You know, that's, uh, this is what it looks like. It's, it drains your economy, it hemorrhages it. Okay, uh, some more, a few more pictures, and then I'm gonna clo close this down here. Um, this is, uh, the other thing we do is we make solar thermal panels. We manufacture these on the reservation. And this is us putting up a solar thermal panel on the south facing wall of a house. And it's a housing project. And it'll reduce your heating bill by about 20%. 20, 20%. Because uh, it just gets warm and then a blower fan will go off. Like when it hit the thermostat hits 90, then it triggers the blower, the, uh, blower fan and blows hot air into your house. And so where I live, this is what you want to do. You don't want to get solar energy to make electricity to make heat. You just want to make heat, right? It's a, it's a more direct transition, you know? And then this is us manufacturing them. And then this is some people, although it's not winter time, all excited about their solar thermal panel, right? Then this is a really cool guy. I wish I could be this cool. This guy's name is, is a Bob Blake, but we call him Solar Bear. I think he just looks like, kind of like a Care Bear. He's like super cute. And, uh, but this is what he did. This is the Red Lake Tribal Headquarters, right? Now, don't you wish it could be that cool that you could have a solar project like that on the roof of your Tribal Headquarters, right? It's like, right, that's like, he's very cool. But this is local solar, community solar, which is what you, everybody should have, is like in your own community, have your own solar, right? And then this is, uh, this is a little picture of like what it is in Indian country with the potential for renewables, which is very significant. And a lot of our tribes already have massive power lines from our territories, from the dam projects and the coal strip mines and the Navajo Nation's mines, you know, and the, and the you know, Four Corners generating, all of that. So, you know, these are the kind of questions of scaling it. Now, the last few dis, like, kind of larger questions is, uh, uh, <laughs> we don't have a rail system. I don't think anybody needs me to tell you that. I guess you have a little trolley here. But the point is, is like, look at the, <laughs> look at this country here, right? We're like 1%. We think we're so smart, right? <laughs> look at that. Like, everybody else has electrified trains but us, right? You know, and the thing is, is that a combustion engine versus an electric engine, a combustion engine is 16% efficient. Like, what kind of dummies drive around in a 16% efficient, you know? An electric engine is 60% efficient or 65. More efficient systems of, of, of energy. And so what you want to do is you want to build these systems. And here's like some of the, the you know, because the rails went through all of our reservations. You know, and the right of ways should actually be retained by us. You know, in that. But uh, this is idea is called solutionary rail. And solutionary rail is the idea of uh, running the, the turning the train system into electric, like rebuilding the essential infrastructure of this country to not be highways, but to be railways. Because it's a more efficient way of moving things, right? And this, and you can, you can actually direct power it as opposed to, is, you know, I mean, you, the, in their vision, they have like wind turbines powering it. 
Now the last you know, few kinds of questions, this is like the newest late bad idea. I've, my life has been a set of bad ideas. And this one here, the CO2 pipeline. So they take a big pollution, they liquefy the CO2, they put it in pipelines to sequester the carbon, they spend billions of dollars doing this stupid thing, and then they take it back to North Dakota and make more hydrocarbons. I, I, I just don't even believe this idea, right? But this is getting billions of dollars from the federal government under the idea of sequestering carbon, right? So I'm gonna show you how you sequester carbon, right? You ready for this? This is what you do. <laughs> you grow hemp, right? This is it. So this is me in my hemp field a few years ago. It looks like I'm in the 60s and I felt like it at that moment, right? <laughs> and the neighbor to the tribal land had called in and complained about the noxious weeds. And then I went out there and I was like, oh, like the nine foot tall hemp plant noxious weeds, right? So we grow fiber hemp. That's what I do. This is a couple of sons. These two in the middle are my sons. This is a, a nephew, this is my partner, and this is one of our relatives. That's what our hemp looks like. We don't grow marijuana, we grow hemp. We grow fiber hemp. And the thing about fiber hemp is it sequesters carbon at the highest rate of any field crop. And just think of like some simple facts about hemp, like the word canvas comes from cannabis. So imagine like all those sails of all those slave ships, that was hemp. All those tarps that are used, all these boats out here that got blue tarps on them, they used to all make that out of hemp. So, you know, 100 years ago we had a choice basically, or it was in 19, 1938 when they criminalized marijuana, they criminalized hemp too. Minnesota had 11 hemp mills at the time it was criminalized, 11 hemp mills. And uh, I just want them back. I just want them back. And so, you know, the reasons are many. You know, you could replace cotton. Cotton is 24% uh, of the world's agricultural chemicals and 4% of the world's agriculture. You could replace the use of trees and you could keep your forests for building materials or for paper. And in the meantime, you could sequester carbon at the highest rate. And so our work is in building an inner tribal, it's an indigenous hemp cooperative. That's what we're working on. Now, I'll show you a couple things. This is my hemp skirt, which I wore. I'm gonna show you this a little bit later, but this is our hemp bag. This is a Patagonia bag. And this is our hemp in this Patagonia bag. You can buy it for $250 from Patagonia. I'm telling you, they didn't pay us that much. <laughs> but the point is, is that, is that this could be done. And the hemp that went into this bag, we grew. Then it went to North Carolina to get decorticated. Then it went to Virginia to get degummed. Then it went to Mexico to get spun. Then it went to like uh, Washington State to get woven. And then it went to California to get cut and turned into this bag. And I just think our hemp shouldn't have to travel so far. Right, you understand what I'm saying? You need to rebuild a textile economy that makes sense and it needs to be regional, right? And not only can you do this, this is the outside of the, of the, of the uh, plant, the inside is what you make this out of, which is hemp herd. And this is my farm that you saw those boys on, me adding a room on it so that I can move back in because I can't live with all those boys. And that is hemp herd put in SIP panels, basically. We built panels that are four by, or a six by eight. And, and they built them out in Bismarck and we put this up in six hours, the walls. This is the future of low cost housing. It's a foot thick panels. It's climate change resilient. It's, you know, mold free sequesters carbon and it's uh, resilient. You know, you don't want to be building a lot of stick houses in the times ahead. You want to build some solid stuff and this is what it looks like. And then there's my cute bag. And then uh, here's just a little bit more on building materials. Here's us distributing seeds. This is Gianna Denker, she's from Oklahoma. She's a uh, Choctaw. This is, uh, yeah distributing seeds to the cooperative, and this is the future, which is hemp batteries. Because of the way they grow, it grows so fast. See, when it grows eight feet or nine feet in the course of a summer, it, sequester, it like sucks that carbon into it, and when it sucks that carbon into it, it makes a graphene. And they use the graphene for the batteries or the supercapacitors. Now, if they would invest as much in the hemp supercapacitors and hemp batteries as they are investing in the carbon sequestration pipelines, we'd have it, 
right? But that's why, you know, that's why, you know, they ain't going to save us. We got to keep working on it. This is my village on a bad day. You know, everything you don't want to have, we got it, believe me. But then this is our work in our village, our solar project. This is our work in our village. If you're going to have an ugly housing project that was built in the 1960s in the war on poverty, might as well paint her, right? That's what we've been doing, right? I mean, you know, and one day when they, I mean, a couple of those houses burned down, I'm going to try to get the tribe to let me put them up with hemp, right? I mean, it's these housing projects, every reservation has one like this. It was built in the 1970s in a war on poverty. And they're still there, and we're still poor. <laughs> and then this is uh, my last couple of photos, but this is the library that I work at. So this is called a Carnegie Library. They all look kind of like the same. I don't know if you've ever seen them. And so this guy named Andrew Carnegie, in 1901, he was the richest guy in the world. And he made his money mining iron ore in northern Minnesota from our people. He took our land and then he created all this U.S. steel. All those guys came from Carnegie, right? And then, in, and then, and then he said, I don't want to be that guy anymore. And he built libraries. He built 2,500 libraries. And they all look kind of like this. If you look around a small town, you can see something like this. That's a Carnegie library. And I know because I was raised in a Carnegie library. That's why I was so excited to like come here and talk at the library. You know, because I was the nerdy kid who went to the library every day, you know, and um, so I have an affection for it. Well, this is Park Rapids, Minnesota, and one day they decided they didn't need that library anymore. They moved it into an old bank building that's kind of, kind of homely and such, but then they sold this to first one, one uh, lawyer, and then they sold it, then the lawyer sold it to Ambridge, the corporation that you know, persecuted us for all those years. And so I'd go outside there with a bunch of ladies and a bunch of people. We'd stand outside that. Every Tuesday, we'd stand outside that office of Enbridge. When they started the occupation of northern Minnesota in January 2021, we'd stand outside. In January 21, I was standing outside that library with my little sign that said, Water is Life. And they'd, like, all hating on us, you know, but uh, we'd stand there. And then it'd be kind of cold, so pretty soon we were dancing. And then pretty soon we had like a whole music scene going on there. And then we go eat Mexican food across the street. And uh, so we, 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 we became very good at the Macarena. We did line dancing, you know, we did all kinds. Of, and I know they were sitting in there going, oh, they're back. The Indians are back and they're dancing again. Ah, oh, they just hated us, you know. Well, you know what happened is that they left. They offloaded all of their properties and we bought the library for them, right? So. So this is us outside and during the occupation. When they were there, we would still, because they didn't own the airspace, you see, and we're very clever, so we would just blast that on the front of their <laughs> building. And see the little Enbridge sign over there? Well, now that sign says Giwaitanon because we turned it into a museum, right? And it, so it opened October 12th, so like a month ago, right? We opened October 12th. We call ourselves a little museum that could. <laughs> because nobody wanted to fund us and the legislature yelled at me and they said, you're a terrorist. And I was like, just wait, just watch. <laughs> and then we did it. And so we're really, really proud of it. And we're proud that the library has a new place for enlightenment. And it's on treaty rights, Anishinaabe people, and the first exhibits are the water protector exhibits. That was like, that's it. So glad to be at this library. Anyway, last uh, couple of thoughts. You know, I just, you know, I shared with you what we do in our community. And kind of my theory is if we could do it, anybody could do it. That's my theory. You know, and all across this country and all across the world, there's actually people doing this kind of cool stuff. You know, it doesn't get the same press as the Kardashians. But, you know, that's the way that one is. So we just do it. You know, and we tell our stories and we keep it up. And, you know, I have the privilege of traveling and seeing people in different communities and seeing the amazing work they do and being inspired by it, you know? And so that is really the work ahead is, you know, to, is a lot of it is regional, a lot of it is local, a lot of it is deep and it's multi, uh, what do you call it, sector. I guess that's what I'd say is it's not just the food system, it's the energy system, it's the health system, it's the, you know, that is what we, we, we do. And then it's also the legal system. So this is a picture of Ecuador and uh, following Bolivia, Ecuador was, I think, a second or third country to declare uh, the rights of Mother Earth. 
uh, saying that the rights of Mother Earth, as shrining it as a part of the Constitution, the rights of Mother Earth, right to regenerate, right to be free of pollution, you know, right to heal, right to continued life. In uh, 2021, the Ecuadorian um, Constitutional Court overturned the mining permits of a Canadian multinational and of a uh, Ecuadorian mining corporation to mine in a protected area, saying that the rights of Mother Earth superseded the rights of the corporation, right? And then in August, I believe it was, or September, a, they had a referendum in Ecuador that said exactly the same thing. 65% of the people said, don't, don't, don't mine in that area, don't go there. And so I say that because, you know, as we look, you know, you know the, the, that's what indigenous thinking looks like. That's what indigenous leadership looks like. The countries that began that, you know, were really like Bolivia is one of the most indigenous countries in the, in, that is in the, in the Western Hemisphere. And the, and the people that are taking this kind of leadership, many people are. You know, the Maori and Aotearoa, also the rights of a river, rights of a mountain there now, New Zealand, Aotearoa. And then uh, in Northern California, the Yurok and the rights of the Klamath, right? And now we look and the dams are coming down, right? So just, you know, just, just remember, you know, you got to keep, keep, keep strong, keep strong in your hearts and prayers. And then also know that the work we do, you know, we, we will, you know, we will work in every piece and, you know, we'll grow the good squash. But, you know, at every level, you know, you all, we also must look to transform these laws. So the rights of Mother Earth supersede the rights of corporations, you know. And that's really our, our uh, opportunity in the time of prophecies to, to care for that which uh, the Creator intended for us to care for, according to really our instructions. So, miigwech, happy to visit with you and thank you very much for your time. Please give it up for our speaker. We, uh, we welcome time for Q&A. <laughs> If folks would like to ask questions, we've got our mic here in the middle. Well, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to have you here. And um, I'm so grateful because I get to work in forestry as well and uh, with the Diné sheep. And so I had some questions uh, about, could you share a bit more about the relationship of the bison and that connection to tr traditional ecological knowledge? Because I know there's a direct correlation between their movement through the ecosystem and the connection to food and medicine. And so I'd just love to hear more about some of those relationships. I mean, I can say some, but you know, I, I would probably defer to a Lakota or a Cheyenne a little bit more on that. You know, we have, they're the western part of our territory, but you know, I was, uh, um, you know, the spiritual relationship of the people, the people of the buffalo. And you know, a long time ago, there was, uh, the, the buffalo used to eat the people. That's what they said, you know? And then they had a lot of, uh, prayers and the, the creator helped to intervene and they had a big race and at the end the, the people I think it was the magpie I think the magpie helped them but anyway this balance this agreement came about that the people would follow the buffalo care you know burn the prairies so that the grass was fresh for the buffalo you know take care of the territory for the buffalo and then only take what they needed you know and and leave the rest and and uh I think that that, uh, you know, obviously you don't get the single largest migratory herd in the world to flourish unless you're doing the right thing, you know. And now just seeing kind of the restoration of buffalo in, in, in their territory, I, I find it to be so uh, um, heartwarming, you know, when you're out there and then you see, I mean, I've, I've cried with everybody else seeing them come back when they release them, you know. Um, but I think that the more that that occurs, I was just down in a village in, in Alabama, a, a traditional Muscogee village, and they had uh, buffalo there. And I was thinking to myself, and they're like, no, buffalo were everywhere. You know, buffalo were in many places. That was the, the you know, this very large animal. And so I feel that that, uh, that spiritual return of the buffalo, you know, we are nowhere near where we need to be. And that, you know, it is a challenging, you know, it is a challenging time, but I, you know, you see that they are, that they are, that it brings a great hope to people when the buffalo come back. Yeah. Thank you. And it changes ecosystems. They, they change it when they come back. Yes. 
It's wonderful to have you here in San Diego. It's very nice to have you. Uh, we have, um, here in San Diego, we have a environmental catastrophe happening. And the catastrophe is with the uh, uh, sewage and from the ocean, from, yes, in Imperial Beach. In yep. Imperial Beach, uh, what I would, what I'm asking you is, how, what would you recommend for San Diegans to do, or what can we do to do something about this environmental catastrophe that we're having? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know the specifics, but it's not very evolved to shit in your water. <laughs> I was, you know, that just like a little observation, you know. So, you know, I mean, I think that, I think that, you know, the basic questions of how you, you know, I mean, the fact is, is that I like, for instance, I'm not opposed to pipes. Like, I like water and sewer pipes. You know what I'm saying? I just don't like oil pipes. And so prioritizing so you have adequate infrastructure, you know, to address and, and you know, and, and uh, you know, be, be far more mindful is essential. And most of these cities have crumbling infrastructure. You know, and yet what you see is money being spent not on this kind of essential infrastructure, but instead on infrastructure for, you know, new non-essential things. You know, whether it's a stadium or a pipeline project, you know, that's not essential infrastructure. And so I think that, you know, prioritizing and evolving, uh, you know, the system so that they are, the, you know, more appropriate, and then just reducing the use. I mean, Americans consume, we just, we just use water and we shouldn't you know, at the level that we are. But the specifics of San Diego is really not something that I, you know, know that, that much about. But I know that this infrastructure problem is a pretty big problem in, in most cities. And, and I just, like, it just baffles me. I mean, it's like the amount of, where was it? It wasn't at San Mateo or Birmingham, Burlingame. Like, you know, these, and it happens out here probably too, like these pipes explode, you know? because they have old pipes. The country has all kind of old pipes. And like who's looking at you know, making corporations clean that one up? They made the money, you know, and then how do you get the correct you know, infrastructure to me? You know, those are the kind of questions of like infrastructure for people and for the planet, not for profits, you know? It's really fundamental things, but yeah. I was just curious if you know of any legal aid support networks for indigenous activists. Like, I know so many were arrested during the protests and stuff. Are there actual, like, bail networks or anything that you are aware of? You know, I mean, we had a lot of lawyers for our cases. You know, we had a thousand people arrested. And so we organized, you know, a bunch of legal uh, defense. And, and for a lot of the water protectors, we've worked hard you know, to get legal support for, for the water protector cases. And I don't know in each state, you know, kind of what there, what there is. Um, but, you know, the fact is, is that uh, on one hand, you know, we need more of them. And then second, I'll, we need to change the laws. She might have an answer to you. Uh, we have books from Red Owl here in San Diego. So if you want to talk to yeah. her, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I was just glad to get the last of my charges dropped. That was a relief. Um, Hi. Thanks for being here. Um, I wanted to ask you about your hemp SIP project and if uh, what I was curious what the adhesive was and then I wondered if anyone had used those panels to turn them into some sort of modular housing or any projects like that. So where are we at with our hemp project? Yeah. Is that what you asked me? Yeah. Um, so we uh, so this was the first bag and then I uh, and so this last week when I went to Al Alabama, I've been on the road for like two weeks, seems like I went home in between and fed the boys. No, there's, a, there's, a, there's, other, there's other people that are there. There's a nephew that's there with them. Uh, but uh, I, went to, uh, I, we, uh, I went to see these guys called Bast Core in Montgomery. And I believe that they can make uh, something you can spin. And so our intention is to you know, because, you know, there's no competition in this industry. That's just to say that you can't grow enough hemp <laughs> to build, do the building industry. 
and the textile industry. And so that's why we're organizing the farmers mostly in our region. Okay. Like South Dakota, Sisseton is like our main area of focus is Sisseton and White Earth and then uh, a little bit up to Turtle Mountain. And so we're, we're organizing to do the textile. I want a textile mill and then the offtake, it's not the offtake, the, the other product out of it is in fact the, um, is in fact the, the herd. Panel. Is that what you asked me? Yeah, the, well, the SIP panel, structural insulated panels, is what they're called that you said you were building the room out of. Yeah. On the side, you know, at your place. So I was just wondering if you had those six foot panels that you were making for that space, if, any, if, if they were being manufactured and used for other applications. You know, I think that there's uh, someone from the Trinidad Rancheria. Um, her name is Lisa Sutherland, I think. She is looking at making the same kind of panels. You know, I, uh, cause I think like I've tried, I did like a hemp build for a small greenhouse, you know what I'm saying? But that's really, it was really great. But uh, we're not talking about artisan level work if you need 10,000 homes. You're talking about something that you can replicate that is sturdy and the foot, you know, the foot thick, I was really impressed with it. And so ours were made in Bismarck. North Dakota, and then uh, we, you know, they just put them on a semi and brought them over. But then we were looking at it, and we were like, we could do that. You know, if we're growing the hemp, I mean, it was framing. And then, uh, but the system is a really replicable system, and I think that it, it's America Chanvera, I think is how you say it, these guys out of Pennsylvania, who they developed a machine, it's kind of like blow-in insulation, and they make a hemp slurry, a hemp lime slurry, and they blow it into the form, and then they let it cure. And, uh, you know, I'll, we'll see how it goes, but I think it's, uh, you know, considered to be a pretty high R value. And, uh, yeah, it's a great solution. Yeah, I'm very excited about it. Yeah. I mean, you know, and, and in a couple of years, we should, you know, we're looking to do like two model homes next year for elders. What is the messaging that you would offer to children now? To children? Children, yeah, youth, young people. I mean, you know, so I got, I work with a lot of kids and, and a lot of our work is first of all, you know, just, I mean, reaffirming, I'd say their spiritual center in relationship to the earth, you know, cause I mean, I mean, when those Hopis were talking about that the world be changing when there's a web in the sky, you know, we can all see it. It's very clear, like people talk about freedom, but they seem to spend 80% of their time looking at something about this big. You know, they're looking at their little phone all the time, you know, and so that is not healthy. And we know that. And so I spend a lot of time with little kids, just kind of like with the animals and then just kind of teaching them the gardening. And then, you know, remembering who we, you know, not only who we are, but finding our power in that. You know, and uh, there's just a lot of good examples of, of uh, you know, how you change the world, you know, or how you change things, and you can start doing that when you're young, you know. So, thank you. I don't know if I answered your question, but. It did, thank you. Thank you, yeah. What kind of communication with children do you have between the ages of one to two months? I mean, I don't really have a lot of support. I mean, I haven't asked any of these tribes out here for supporter financing, maybe they want to help fund our solar thermal work or something. But, um, you know, in our area, the Mille Lacs Band and Shakopee is a couple of the tribes and they have historically helped us some in our work out there. You know, I'm not, uh, I'm not, uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I, uh, I'm more of a farmer than a casino Indian. Um, <laughs> You know, and I see how this has happened. I mean, basically, they said to uh, in Indian people, we're not going to, you know, protect your land or you're not going to return your land or your water or your, you know, we aren't going to return that, but we'll give you a casino, you know, and, and we hope that works out for you. You know, and so, I mean, California has a lot of really wealthy casino tribes, and some of them are involved in renewable energy and in, you know, sustainable food systems. And a lot of them are using, like some of the tribes are really like, Shakopee is really good about that. They have like some of the most advanced renewable energy and, and sustainability programs in the, in, the, in the state, you know. And so, uh, and some of these projects, I think Red Lakes was par financed partially by their casino. You know, so a lot of the tribes are trying to do that, you know, which is right. 
you know, take the money and do something good with it. You know, I myself, I'm, I'm probably, you know, I would really try to, I like, a lot of my goal is to reduce the amount of money you need. Because I don't think, I don't, I don't think people should want more money. I think they should just want life. <laughs> you know, and those things are not always the same, you know, so thank you. I'm going to take this one last question from the sister. Did you, did you, were you the ones? Yeah. name brands or corporations have asked to work with you besides Patagonia? I, I mean, you told us about people, you know, coming after you, basically, or the land. Has there been anybody doing the opposite that may be working towards better? That, are you asking if more corporations want to work with us? Yes. Besides Patagonia? You know, I, I think that once we get to, uh, I mean, you know, one is once we get to Canvas, everybody will want to work with us. You know, because nobody's got to canvas here except for these guys down in Alabama. And I was like, you can't make all the van shoes in this country out of the canvas from one facility. You understand, you understand exactly what I'm saying, right? The use of canvas in this country is a pretty significant thing. You know, so, I mean, I was in a meeting and van shoes was there and they were like, yeah, how are you doing there? And I was like, yeah, give me a break. You know, we're, we're get, I, I want to get it. But then I also just want us to, you know, uh, so we hope to work with them because scaling, like I don't necessarily want to work with them, but what you need to do is scale this and you need to finance it, right? And so it's going to need to be financed by a lot of sources, including a bunch of people who want to buy really expensive tennis shoes. You know, go ahead and then buy them from us. Like just ethically source, ethically source. Don't be saying you're doing green and it's not ethically sourced. You know, the thing that irritated me there that Patagonia doesn't have us on their label. If you look at the, at the little uh, QR, you could find us buried down there at the bottom. I was like, come on, bro. You know, I mean, we're the ones who grew it, right? And so now I want to, you know, I want to own the next round. And we're looking at eighth generation to, that's a native company to do a blanket with some churro wool, you know, from the Navajos and, and our hemp. That's our next project. You know, so that it's all indigenous and, and then, um, and then, you know, following that, you know, in, in my dreams, you know, we get these hemp cooperatives going and Cheyenne River and Pine Ridge and Sisseton and White Earth, you know, four or five of those reservations could, could make a lot of, of, of canvas and in the same time make a lot of housing, which is what we need. So I'm really excited. Did you all get that I'm really excited about hemp? Yeah, I was like, I'm the hemp girl, you know? I mean, everybody's like super excited about marijuana and they just legalized marijuana in Minnesota. I'm like, that's great, but I'm still gonna grow hemp. You know, because that's, that's the revolution. We call it the new green revolution. You know, because the last revolution, the last green revolution kind of left us a lot of industrial ag and the Central Valley. You know, and I think that this is the antidote to that. And uh, plus you get to grow a lot of cool plants. Anyway, thank you all for your time. I know that I'm going to answer some books. And thank you for your questions. Thank you. Thank you.